Okay, this is the pre-lab um, lecture for experiment 11. In experiment 11, we're going to be isolating uh, the active ingredient in an Aleve um, analgesic tablet, which is called naproxen sodium. And naproxen sodium, it turns out, is um, an optically active compound, or at least one enantiomer of the drug is placed um, in the Aleve tablet. And if you read through the procedure and the background material, what you'll find is that Aleve is made up of one enantiomer of the um, what's called naproxen sodium. And an Aleve tablet contains only the S enantiomer of naproxen sodium. Um, and here's your chiral center right here. The S enantiomer has analgesic properties, whereas what they found is that the R enantiomer has some liver toxicity issues. So when you get an Aleve tablet or a generic Aleve tablet, which is what we're going to use this week, you should get only the S enantiomer in that. And it turns out that each tablet contains 220 milligrams, 220 milligrams of naproxen sodium per tablet. That's the concentration uh, that it's sold at. Now, naproxen sodium is just simply this carboxylic acid deprotonated and the sodium salt of that. So that's why we call it naproxen sodium. So the S enantiomer is all that should be found in the Aleve tablet. And it turns out that its specific rotation is minus 11 at 20 degrees, is minus 11 degrees is what it's reported at. Um, so what happens when you take an Aleve tablet is the naproxen sodium, when it gets into your stomach, it reacts with the HCl in the um, acid, the stomach acid, and that HCl protonates the carboxylic acid salt to become a carboxylic acid, and this is now naproxen. It's called the molecule naproxen. So it turns out that naproxen is the actual active ingredient in the uh, tablet because that's what form it's in when it gets into the stomach and then goes out into the bloodstream. The conversion factor is that it, each tablet contains 220 milligrams of uh, naproxen sodium and if you convert that, that will be, oops, sorry, 220 milligrams then converts to 200 milligrams of naproxen per tablet um, because naproxen sodium has a higher molecular weight. So we're going to use these two conversions. We're going to use five tablets. So our theoretical yields would be 5 times 220 milligrams of naproxen sodium and then 5 times 200 milligrams um, or 1 gram of naproxen would be the final uh, theoretical yield. So what we're going to do is extract the naproxen sodium from the original leaf tablet, convert it to naproxen using HCl just like what would happen in your stomach, and then we're going to extract that with dichloromethane, and we're going to determine the specific rotations of each of the two components. Okay. And so as I said earlier, the specific rotation that we're going to use, which was reported in the uh, Journal of Chemical Education a paper that I adapted this experiment from, turns out to be minus 11 degrees, and the specific rotation of the naproxen, because it's a different compound, turns out to be plus uh, 66 degrees is what it's been reported at. So as you can see, the two compounds have different specific rotations. The enantiomer, this is the S minus enantiomer then, and this is the S plus an antiomer because I have not changed the configuration of the chiral center. All I've done is simply protonate 
the carboxylic acid. And why does the rotation change? Well, these are two different compounds, and hopefully you learned in lecture, that there's no direct relationship between S configurations and the, whether the compound is D or L. Some S compounds are D, some S compounds are L, and this is one perfect example where the naproxen sodium and the naproxen are two different molecules. Therefore, in one case, the S is the L enantiomer, and in the other case, the S is the D enantiomer. So we're going to use these specific rotations to calculate then our um, what we're, we're going to try we're, we're going to use these to calculate the percentage of each enantiomer in the molecule or in the mixture. But to be honest, they should be 100%. So when we don't get 100%, it just means we've got error in the um, experiment. So going back to lecture then, the specific rotation is what we use as the physical property of a chiral molecule. It's calculated by taking the experimental observation, which you're going to get from the polarimeter in this experiment, and dividing through by the cell length in decimeters, and then your concentration in grams per milliliter. Now, we our cell is a 1.1 decimeter cell. And so for the cell length, you're always going to use 1.1 decimeters as the cell length. I'll talk about at the end of this video how we get the concentrations of the naproxen and the naproxen sodium, but they're going to be calculated in grams per milliliter of the solvent. But once I have my observed rotation, which I get from the polarimeter in the instrument room, I'll then be able to um, calculate the specific rotation and compare that to the minus 11 for naproxen sodium and the plus 66 for naproxen itself, the carboxylic acid. Okay. Now, if you have a mixture of enantiomers, you can use the specific rotation to calculate the percentages of the materials um, of the two enantiomers. And I'll just go over that briefly. It's also in your layman um, lab manual. But the naproxen sodium in a leaf has actually been, its specific rotation has been reported uh, a number of values. In this case, we're going to use minus 11 degrees as our literature value. Now, when you have a mixture of enantiomers, we sometimes talk about that mixture of enantiomers having what's called an enantiomeric excess. And the enantiomeric excess is simply nothing more than the percent major enantiomer minus the percent minor enantiomer. So if you had a mixture that was 75% plus and 25% minus, what you would end up having is what we call a 50% enantiomeric excess of the plus enantiomer. That just simply means that the plus or the D enantiomer in this specific case is in 50% excess of the smaller, of the minor enantiomer. So we just simply subtract the percentages to get our enantiomeric excess. Of course, if we had a racemic mixture, we would end up with 50% R, or 50% D, 50% L, so we would end up with a 0% enantiomeric excess if the system was, if the mixture was a racemic mixture. And if it's a racemic mixture, then it doesn't rotate plain polarized light. So this percent enantiomeric excess can actually be used to calculate the percentages of the major and minor enantiomers in the system. So let's say, for instance, that we have that we assume that no, this is a lousy calculation. But let's say that we're going to assume that the specific rotation for naproxen sodium is, and I'm going to do something I shouldn't, but I'm going to change this to minus 11 degrees. And let's say our specific mixture had a rotation of, oh, I don't know, minus 8 degrees. Okay. Now, if we had this system, so we have a mixture of enantiomers having a degree of rotation of minus 8 degrees, and we know that the pure L 
enantiomer of naproxen is minus 11. The way we would calculate this equation is we would calculate this equation by taking the fraction of the plus or the fraction of the D enantiomer and multiply that times the specific rotation of the D enantiomer. And then we would add that to the fraction of the L enantiomer and multiply that by the specific rotation of the L enantiomer. And that equation then would give us the specific rotation of the mixture. So in this specific case, what I would have is I would have minus 8 degrees is going to equal the, and I'm going to just call this a the fraction of the D enantiomer times the specific rotation of the D enantiomer, which we know in this case the D enantiomer is the positive enantiomer, right? It's the dextro rotary. So that would be times 11 degrees pl plus the fraction of the L enantiomer times the specific rotation of the L uh, enantiomer, which in this case is minus 11 degrees. And why do I write 11 degrees Celsius? Just used to it. So if I have this equation, this is one of the two equations that I'm going to have to solve for the fraction of D and the fraction of L. The other equation that I'm going to use to solve this equation, or to solve this, because this is one equation and two unknowns, my second equation is that my fraction of 1 is split, my whole amount is split into the fraction of D plus the fraction of L. So if I take these two equations and I solve them simultaneously, I'm going to get answers for the fraction of D and the fraction of L, the fraction of the D enantiomer and the fraction of the L enantiomer. Now which one's going to have the higher percentage? Well in this case because the mixture had a negative rotation that means that I'm going to have more of a fraction of L than of a fraction of D. Okay, And I could go through and solve this equation um, minus 8 equals and then I'd have to salt, take this equation and say, okay, 1 minus fraction of D equals fraction of L. So then I have to come down here and say, okay, the fraction of D times 11 plus 1 minus the fraction of D times minus 11. If I substitute the fraction of L into this equation, 1 minus fraction of D, and so then I could go through and solve this equation, which would be minus 8 equals fraction of D is equal to 11 times the fraction of D plus a minus 11 minus 11 times the fraction of D. And so now solving for, let's see, the minus, it's going to be, sorry, plus 11 times the fraction of D, because minus fraction of D times minus 11. So what I have here, if I solve for this, is I've got 22 fractions of D is equal to plus 11 minus 8, which is equal to 3. Because I'm going to take and move the minus 11 to the other side, so I've got 22. So the fraction of D then is equal to... 3 over 22, and 3 over 22 is going to be, and yes, I'm using my phone calculator to do this, would be 13.6%. Our fraction would be 0 0.136. 
So the fraction of D is equal to 0.136, which means then, so I'm going to put that here, the fraction of L would be 8, 6, 4. So what this means is that the fraction of D would be, it would be 13.6% if I convert it from fraction to percentage, and here it would be 86.4%. So a mixture, an 86.4% mixture of L and 13.6% 13 mixture of D would give me a specific rotation of minus 8. Okay, that's actually how you can solve the equation using these two equations and two unknowns. And that's probably an easier way, and don't worry about this solution because this solution doesn't make any sense because I used these numbers that didn't make any sense. So, okay, so that's one way to um, solve this problem, which you will have to do for the pre-lab lecture or for the pre-lab assignment, that's one way is by solving these two equations and two unknowns. Now, while I have a moment, I will show you another way to solve the problem, and you can use either one for the pre-lab assignment, but if you look, the percent in antiomeric excess could actually also give you the solution to the percentages of D and L in antiomers. So if you look at the 50% in antiomeric excess, that actually will give you the percentage or give you the optical rotation of the mixture. So let me just show you how we do that. So in this case, we said that we had, we have minus 8 as our mixture specific rotation and the pure naproxen sodium, the pure L form, is minus 11. So what that means is that we have, in terms of our, let's say, fraction of our specific rotation, we have minus 8 out of minus 11. And that will actually equal, then, the percent in antimeric excess of the mixture, or actually this minus 8 over 11 times 100 would give us the percent in antiomeric excess of the mixture. So if I did that calculation, I can calculate the percent in antiomeric excess, which would be 7.727 times 100. So this would be 0.727 times 100 equals the percent in antiomeric excess. So that means that our percent in antiomeric excess is 72.7%. Now, that's the percent in antiomeric excess. I know because the sign of the mixture was negative that the major component is the negative in antiomer, or the L in antiomer. So now what I have to do is I have to come up with the percent of the L minus the percent of the D equals 72.7 percent. And so if you want to be real mathematical about it, basically what I know is I know that the percent L plus the percent D has to equal 100 percent, right? And so then I can just go, okay, doesn't take any linear algebra or anything like that. Just add these two up. 2% 2 of L's equals 172.7% over 2. Gives me the percent L's, which is going to be... Shouldn't even have to use a calculator on this one. but I will just to be on the safe side. So that means the percent L equals 86.2, or uh, sorry, 86.4%, which hopefully is the same answer I got before. Oh, it is, there we go. 
So you can also solve the equations this way. Um, I, I suppose this is probably easier than the other way. Um, but you can make use of the percent and antimeric excess as well. And you'll get then the percentage of the D would equal 100 minus 86.4, which would give you then our 13.6% that we had earlier. Okay, so either way, you can calculate a per, the percentages of DNL and antimers in a mixture by using the specific rotation. And so either solve it this way or use the percent of antimeric excess and solve the two equations it does not matter to me. But you should get um, the percentages. Now, the problem with using specific rotation as a measurement of the purity of the component is that, the, as you'll see at the end of this experiment, that the specific rotation has a lot of error in it, at least in terms of the sol making the solutions. And so it's not very sensitive to small percentages of impurities. And so if you were working for the company that makes this naproxen sodium and you had to verify that you had 99.999% of the naproxen sodium in the L form because you didn't want any D form because you probably want to keep your company and not be sued um, for people who have liver toxicity issues after taking your your pill plus the humanitarian thing is not to include the liver toxicity compound in the original pill but if you're not into humanitarian stuff then you can be into lawyers and lawsuits but either way, the specific rotation is not sensitive enough to pick up 99 or 99 point so many nines percentages that would be required. So there are other ways to do that. Those of you who are in my lecture class, I talked about chiral GC as another possibility. But we're going to use this equation despite the fact that all of our materials should be in 100% of either the L form or the D form for the naproxen sodium and naproxen respectively. Okay, so you can use either one of these methods to calculate your specific rotation. From your specific rotation, you can calculate the percentages of Ds and Ls. And there's one question for you to do that in the pre-lab assignment. All right, here's the procedure that you're going to use. You're going to take five tablets, five probably generic Aleve tablets, either coming from CVS or Walmart. You're going to place those in methanol, and when you place them in methanol, the blue coating will peel away. Then you're going to transfer the five tablets, which at this point minus their blue coating, into a fresh methanol in a beaker. Um, you're going to transfer them with forceps, and then you're going to use a magnetic stir bar, which will stir the solution and crush the tablets, probably crushing them with a uh, glass stirring rod first and then letting the magnetic stir bar stir the solution for 20 minutes. You're going to do this on the hot plate with the heater off or else you'll have a fire because the methanol will catch on fire. So make sure that this, this, the hot plate stirrer is off and you're just using the stirring um, portion. So hopefully that will dissolve the naproxen sodium into the methanol over the course of 20 minutes. Not all the tablet will dissolve because there's a lot of binder in that tablet as well. Only 220 milligrams is actually naproxen sodium. So then you're going to gravity filter the solution to remove the binder. You're going to wash the filter paper with a couple of mils of methanol to try and get as much of the naproxen sodium into the solution as possible. Will you lose some? Yes, you will. So that will be a source of error. Then you're going to transfer that solution, which should be relatively clear, but it won't be completely clear, into a graduated cylinder, and then you're going to determine the total volume of the solution. You may say, why are you going to determine the total volume of the solution? Because remember that in the specific equation, specific rotation equation, you need to know the concentration of the solution, and so this way we'll know the volume um, of our mass of the five tablets that we'll I'll talk about in a moment or two or ten minutes. So then you're going to take that graduated cylinder to the instrument room 
and you're going to have the experimental optical rotation determined using the polarimeter. Make sure you take your notebook with you to the instrument room and you write down not only the number that you get but the sign of it because it's important that we have the negative sign to go with that specific, that optical rotation. And it's important you take your notebook because otherwise you're going to have to remember the numbers as you leave the instrument room and go back to the organic lab. And if it's me, I'm shouting random numbers at you as you leave the room to reinforce the idea that you need to bring your notebook. So make sure you bring your notebook to write the number and the data down. After you record the optical rotation, you're then going to take the solution back to the lab. You're going to put the methanol solution into a 100 milliliter round bottom flask and then we're going to remove the solvent by rotary evaporation. This will take a couple minutes because methanol has a higher boiling point, so we're going to have to really use a lot of heat um, and try and rotary evaporate it as quickly as possible. After the, ro after the rotary evaporator has removed the methanol, you'll have solid naproxen sodium in the round bottom flask. You'll then add 15 milliliters of water to that round bottom and then add Eight, three molar HCl drop wise so you're going to add a drop of HCl, swirl the solution and then test the solution with pH paper and you test with pH paper by dipping in a stirring rod and then touching that drop of solution to the pH paper and after your solutions become acidic you should see a white precipitate form and you'll basically make a slurry um, after the solution is acidic, you're going to transfer that slurry or as much as you can to the 125 milliliter separatory funnel. Then you're going to add 15 milliliters of dichloromethane to the round bottom to try and dissolve as much of the solid as you can. And then transfer that dichloromethane then to the separatory funnel so you'll have your two layers set up. Now if you don't get all of the solid to transfer, then what you need to do is you need to add 5 mils of dichloromethane and 5 mils of water together and then swirl in the round bottom and then transfer that solution as well. If you don't get all of the, all the solid out of the round bottom, well that's going to be another source of error. The key thing for getting the extraction to work is the following. That the HCl converts the naproxen sodium to naproxen. Going back here to our original structures, here's our naproxen sodium, here is our naproxen. So when I add HCl to the naproxen sodium, I'm converting it from carboxylic acid salt to carboxylic acid. If you're having a sense of deja vu, hey, I've done that before, you did. You did it when you were doing the Excedrin ex tablet extractions you converted the aspirin's carboxylic acid to a salt and then reconverted it into the carboxylic acid with HCl. So if it's kind of like, hey, haven't I done this before? Yes, you did. Now, when we did this with the aspirin tablet, we then got the aspirin to precipitate out a solution and we collected by filtration. That doesn't work very well with naproxen. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to extract the solution with dichloromethane. So HCl converts naproxen sodium to naproxen. Well, it turns out that naproxen sodium is only soluble in water, not dichloromethane, and naproxen is only soluble in dichloromethane and not in water. So to ensure that all the naproxen sodium is converted to naproxen, we're going to add an additional 10 milliliters of 3 molar HCl to the separatory funnel. And then you're going to cautiously shake it. Now, if you see a lot of cloudiness, you might have to add another 5 mils of dichloromethane to get all of the naproxen to dissolve. But in the end, all the converted naproxen sodium to naproxen, the naproxen should then be in the dichloromethane layer and there'll be some cloudiness, but not a tremendous amount of cloudiness to the solutions. Okay, and so this is the procedure that we worked out in the spring. So at this point, you're going to have to determine the identities of the layers, which one is organic, which one is aqueous, and then you're going to drain the organic layer into a clean Erlenmeyer flask. 
You're going to dry the solution then with sodium sulfate. And then we need to make an optical rotation measurement on the dipraxin. So you're going to transfer that dried solution to a clean, dry, 100 milliliter graduated cylinder and then record the total volume of the solution. Again, we'll need the total volume to figure out concentration, to figure out specific rotation. Take that solution in the graduated cylinder to the instrument room, and you're going to record the optical rotation of the napraxin. Now, the napraxin is, the D, is a D, an antimer, so therefore the positive, you should get a positive sign this in this case. Okay, and write, again, take your notebook to write down the number and the sign. So then after you return to the lab, you're going to transfer the solution to a clean, dry, and teared 100 milliliter round bottom flask. Then we're going to remove the, rotor, the dichloromethane by rotary evaporation. Then you can record the mass of the napraxin that remains in the round bottom flask. That's going to be our mass of napraxin that we're going to divide by our volume of the solvent that we used to get our concentration to get our specific rotation. Then you're going to try and scrape out as much of the solid as possible. You don't have to get it all because you've already determined the mass um, of the sample in the round bottom flask. So you try and get as much into a weighing dish as you can, dry the solid for, for 10-15 minutes in the oven, then you're going to determine the melting point of the dipraxin to compare it to the literature value. Okay, and then you're going to dispose of all the wastes in the waste bottle. You'll turn in the dipraxin, and I'll put the dipraxin in its own separate waste stream. Now, you have to determine the specific rotation of the dipraxin sodium and the dipraxin itself. So let me go over how we determine the specific rotations of those, and then I'll go back to the lab report. So for the napraxin sodium, we are going to make an assumption, a lousy assumption, but we're going to make it nonetheless, that in order to determine our specific rotation, we need to know what the specific, what the observed rotation is. Well, we get that from the instrument. We need to know what the cell length is. Cell length's 1.1 decimeters. We need to know what the concentration is. Well, this is where we're going to have to make an assumption. So what we need to know is how many milligrams of napraxin sodium were there in how many milliliters of methanol. Well, if you go back to the procedure, which I will, when you go back to the procedure, after you gravity filtered your solution, you transferred it to a graduated cylinder and to determine the total volume of the solution. Well, that's the total volume then that you're going to use, the total volume of methanol that you're going to use for this calculation of concentration. How many milligrams of napraxin sodium are we going to use? Well, here's where we're going to make the assumption. We're going to make the assumption that we did not lose any napraxin sodium in our filtration. And so we're going to say we had five tablets times 220 milligrams of napraxin sodium. So we're going to assume that we have 1.1 grams of napraxin sodium in how many ever milliliters of methanol that you, that you got. That concentration then is what we're going to use with the specific rotation that we got in the first step to then give us or our observed rotation to give us our specific rotation of napraxin sodium. Okay, is that going to be an accurate specific rotation? <laughs> well, not. It will be only if you didn't lose any napraxin sodium along the way. So, no, it's probably not going to be very accurate. So, that's okay. Now, for the second napraxin, we're actually going to get a much better specific rotation because it won't have the error of assuming. So when we have the napraxin, we still have the same issue. To calculate our specific rotation, we need an observed rotation. Well, we'll get that when we take our dichloromethane solution to the instrument room and get its specific rotation uh, measured. 
we still have the same 1.1 decimeter cell length. Now what am I going to use for my concentration? Well, how many milliliters of dichloromethane solution did you have? Well, that's why you're supposed to take this, after, before you take the solution to the instrument room, you're supposed to record the total volume of the dichloromethane solution after drying it with sodium sulfate. So we know that total volume. How about the mass? Well, we're going to get the mass of the solu mass of that solution by getting the mass of the naproxen that was left in the round bottom flask. So that's why you're determining the mass, the tear mass of the round bottom and then the mass after rotary evaporation. So your volume then will come from the total volume of the CH of the dichloromethane solution that you used. As far as the grams, and I don't, why did I say milligrams up here? So in terms of the grams of naproxen, where did that come from? That came from the mass of naproxen in the round bottom flask after evaporation. So the naproxen concentration should be a lot more accurate than this naproxen sodium concentration because here the only assumption that I'm making, and that's even a big assumption, is that all of the white powder in the naproxen is naproxen. And of course it may not be because I may have some binder that I didn't get, that I had originally um, in the solution. So that's how we're calculating our specific rotations and that more particularly this is how we're calculating the concentrations of the solutions that we use for measuring our specific rotations. Okay, so that's where the concentrations are coming from. You're going to turn in a lab report, but the lab report will only include the things that I've asked for. You'll have a data table. You're going to have Data, data observations and the procedure. You are going to write out the complete procedure that you used, including a reference to the procedure, which can either be my reference or the original JCHEMET article. And you're going to include all your data and observations. Then you're going to do calculations in the data. So you're going to report your observed rotations, including the signs of naproxen sodium and the naproxen. And you show how you calculated the specific rotations of the naproxen sodium and the praxin using that specific rotation equation and the concentrations as I just showed you how to get them. You're going to report the mass of the final isolate in the praxin and calculate its percent yield. We, are, we, used, we started with five tablets and there are 200 milligrams of napraxin per tablet, so that means that we have a theoretical yield of 1.0 grams. That's our theoretical yield of naproxen along the way. Should make an easy calculation for percent yield. You're going to determine uh, the melting point of naproxen and then include that versus the literature value to see how pure your sample was. You should also include your appearance of the naproxen as well so that you uh, can indicate the purity because it should be a white or a colorless solid. Then for sources of air, I'd like you to compare the specific rotations of the naproxen sodium and the naproxen to the literature values. We're going to assume that the compounds are still pure enantiomers, that no that no um, change in chirality has occurred. That's what racemization means. So you can't say, oh, well, L turned into D or D turned into L. No, not going to happen. 
because if it just happens in the extraction then it's happening in my stomach and I value my liver so I don't want it to be um, bombarded by toxins from Aleve tablets. So the, the chiral centers didn't change. So if you did not get the literature value, you're going to want to think about why the specific rotations don't match up with the literature value. And as I've said here, ex instrument error is not a possibility. So you have to think about product loss potentially. You have to think about potential impurities that could still be in your sample. And so how would they affect the specific rotation that you observed? If you had impurities in your sample, would it raise or lower the specific rotation that you've observed? Okay, and there's actually a post-lab question on that. And then you're going to include at least five sources of error, um, so of product loss in your experiment. That's five sources over both of the experiments. So that's a combination of where you lost naproxen sodium as well as naproxen. There are five post-lab questions, um, and so you're going to include a Fisher projection showing the configuration of S naproxen, and then the rest of the questions you can go ahead and answer. B, I've given you the answer in this pre-lab lecture. Um, for C, we have the assumption that a naproxen sodium tablet has partially uh, racemized. So if the specific rotation of the tablet was minus 5.6 and the specific rotation of pure naproxen sodium is minus 11, calculate the percentages of RNS. Okay. And use the RNS, the same RNS configuration to D and L. Um, relationship that naproxen sodium has. And then I want you to discuss a little bit about the errors and how different things would affect your specific rotation that you're measuring. For instance, if you if not all the naproxen sodium dissolved in methanol, would you expect the specific rotation that you were to observe in that case to be higher or lower than the literature value? where some of the insoluble leave tablet components end up in the final naproxen sodium methanol solution, how would they affect the specific rotation that you're supposed to have measured? Okay, and this is all, all these sections, this is it for the, um, the, for the naproxen um, lab report. So you're just going to answer these post-lab questions as well as the stuff that was on the previous slide. Okay, so that's the pre-lab lecture for the naproxen sodium, which is our last lab of the semester. Yay.